Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to uh, all of you around the world. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, be here this afternoon in Sydney for this live scan demonstration uh, in a young woman that uh, has uh, endometriosis. Um, a big thank you today to Canon, uh, and we're using their uh, Prism Edition Aplio i800, which is their latest platform for uh, ultrasound in women's imaging. And so we're going to obviously take advantage of some of the features of this machine today. A young patient today um, has come to our practice or come to our attention uh, when one of my sonographers early in September scanned her doing a basic pelvic ultrasound scan and thought that she may have underlying rectal endometriosis. And this, this young woman's situation or presentation is quite similar to many women that we see through our service in that she's had uh, three basic pelvic ultrasound scans over the last two to three years, uh, but to date no one's uh, necessarily seen or localized any form of endometriosis. So what we're going to do today is going, to going through systematically looking at all aspects of her pelvis in accordance with the IDEA consensus statement to get an understanding of the location and the extent of her endometriosis and then bring that information together in a way that's going to be very helpful for the team that's going to subsequently look, at, subsequently look after her in the context that she may undergo uh, joint surgery. So at the start of the procedure, so the probe is sitting just at the introitus, and so my hand is pointing probably at 45 degrees back towards the sacrum, and so at the start of the scan, what my aim is to do is to look specifically at the uh, muscularis propria of the rectal wall, and in doing so, and so what we do is just basically keep an eye on that muscularis propria. And I always bring up a cursor just to enable me to continue to focus on this. And the aim during the first part of this scan is to ignore all aspects of uterus and ovaries, which are part of our basic pelvic scan and focus directly on the actual rectum itself. And so what we can see is we place that probe just inside and then now we're ascending towards from the lower rectum. Now we're in the upper rectum. We can see straight away that there's the presence here of an endometriotic lesion within the anterior muscularis of the rectum. So one of the first things that we need to do in accordance with the idea consensus statement is when we see these sorts of lesions is we need to measure them in three planes. And so we will do that for you now. That's great. We want to measure that uh, longitudinally and we want to also measure that in the AP plane and then we will archive that. And then we will have a look at that in the transverse plane. Just coming to view just here. So this is at the start of the scan. We'll come back to this at the end of the scan, but it's worthwhile getting a feel for what's happening from the outset as well. And the other thing that's really important when we're looking at the actual rectum itself, when we can see that there is potentially the presence of rectal endometriosis. We want to then follow that bowel cephalic to the lesion so that we can then have an understanding or an appreciation as to whether or not we think that there's a lesion cephalic to that. And so this is the rectal wall wrapping around probably the fundus of the uterus. I think it's a retroverted uterus, but we'll test that or confirm that later on. And so we can see that that bowel is wrapping quite nicely around the uterus itself. Keeping it very, very clearly, you can see. And in this situation as well, contrary to popular belief, my patients don't get bowel prepped and you don't need to bowel prep these patients. So you can get such great views. We can see now that we're past the um, uh, rectosigmoid junction and now we're now sitting probably in the sigmoid and we can see quite clearly, we can see very nicely as that sigmoid resting up against bladder and heading cephalically. So, and as we rewind that view now heading back cordally and again following the anterior muscularis of the rectal wall, sliding nicely against one of the ovaries. We'll come back to that ovary later on in the scan. We wanna get a feel just gently And so I think it's a unifocal rectal lesion. And when we look at that rectal lesion again, we'll do so in the context of the actual bowel itself. There is our bowel just there. There's our uterus. And this is the rectal lesion just here. 
So we can see that this is the rectum, and here's the bowel, just sorry, here's the uterus just here. Here's the rectal lesion. As I gently press on that probe, so I'm trying to elicit the sliding sign, and we can see that that bowel is completely fixed to the posterior uterine fundus. It's also fixed here. There's probably um, a lesion of endometriosis just sitting in here, which we'll come back to within the torus uterinus. And so we've got an, probably an antiverted retroflex uterus. So that uterus is being drawn back posteriorly towards that posterior compartment disease that is primarily located in the anterior rectum and also in the uh, torus uterinus just here. So I'm happy with that degree of uh, unifocal rectal lesion, which we've measured in three planes. I'll come back to that later on in the scan. And that's fixed to the posterior uterine fundus and also fixed to the torus uterinus. So when we come to look at the uterus itself, the uterus itself, my sonographer who scanned this young woman before thought that potentially there was some adenomyosis. I think that the uterus itself is probably not necessarily adenomyotic. And so what we're going to do is we're going to measure that uterus in three planes. So we're going to measure that uterus. It's good. You can do that one. That's great. We'll store that. And then we'll come into the transverse. So sorry, well done. Let me look at the transverse view there as well. So that's very good as well. So we can see quite clearly that the ovaries themselves are not uh, fixed in the pouch of Douglas. The right ovary, you could argue in relation just here to the uterus, there may be a degree of fixation. We'll come back to that as well. On the left side, we can see that there's a hemorrhagic corpus luteum within the left ovary, but that left ovary rocks quite freely up against the uh, uterus itself and up against the uterosacral ligament and laterally, I think, up against the pelvic sidewall. Conversely, when we look at the contralateral ovary, which is the right ovary just here, that ovary, I think, is free laterally against the pelvic sidewall, is fixed medially to the uterus, so a nice uh, negative sliding sign at the uterus, and we'll look at its relationship to the uterosacral ligament later on during the scan. So whilst we're there, we will measure that right ovary. On the earlier scan, there was no sign of any endometrioma within the actual um, ovary itself. So we can see we've got an active ovary. There's some follicles present, but there's no specific uh, endometriosis cyst. So we measure that ovary again in three planes. And that's a normal looking ovary, although fixed. That's great. We put some color on as well. And we just open that box. That's fantastic. Just to there. And you can see that that's a very, very sensitive ADF mode for the Doppler assessment of the ovary which is looking normal indeed. And then as I gently swing across towards the left ovary, so we can see that we've got a hemorrhagic corpus luteum, which is completely normal. So we'll measure that left ovary. So this is a sign that she's ovulated recently with no obvious underlying endometrioma within that ovary. And we'll measure that again. So the ovary is pretty much filled with that hemorrhagic cyst, but that's a good prognosticator from the point of view of ovulation. So we're quite happy with that. And again, we'll look at our color Doppler. We can go to our ADF mode, just increase that box. That's fantastic. And you can see that there's that classic reticular hemorrhagic pattern within the actual uh, blood itself. And we've got a relatively good, particularly on the AD, well, that's the SMI function. And when we come back to our ADF function, you can see quite nicely there's that prevascular ring of fire. So we've got a mobile left ovary. 
which can be unusual because usually disease is preferentially on the left side with an ovary sometimes being fixed to sigmoid, fixed to uterosacral ligament or otherwise. We've also demonstrated the ovary itself on the right side, although normal, appears to be fixed to the uterus. We're going to come back to see its relationship to that uterosacral ligament. The actual endometrium itself, I think, looks reasonably okay. And we'll measure the endometrium. That's great. That's good. And we'll place, just place some color on the endometrium. And again, that's our ADF function. So a relatively avascular endometrium, which is good. As I move that probe from one side to the other, looking specifically at the myometrium, uh, again, not necessarily any obvious um, asymmetry between the posterior and the anterior myometrial walls themselves. Slight asymmetry, so 17 versus 15. But remember, it's possible just with a uterine contraction to get some degree of asymmetry anyway. So I think some asymmetry on its own is not necessarily strong evidence that someone may have any issues in relation to myometrial pathology, particularly adenomyosis. So what we're going to do is we're going to look now at the anterior compartment. And I always get my patients to empty their bladder before the ultrasound scan. I usually ask uh, our, our um patients to have a cup of tea about an hour or so just before the scan or tea or coffee, something that's got caffeine in it so that even though their bladder has been empty just before the scan, there's continued uh, urine production and also potential the, uh, the potential to visualize vermiculation within the actual uh, ureters themselves. So I think that the bladder base, which is the, the junction between the uterus and also the ovary, so is the most common site for seeing uh, bladder deep endometriosis. So I think in this instance, I think that the bladder itself is normal. What I would like to do is invert and reverse the screen. And then what we're going to do is, is having done that, we're going to look specifically now for any to look at the ureter itself. Yeah, that's perfect. So in the middle here now, I've got the bladder anteriorly. And as I swing that probe to the right, keeping the bladder base in the field, midfield of view and looking specifically for the ureter on the right side, past the, uh, past the uterus. And we can see quite clearly now, so this is a lovely view just here. So this is the ureter on the right side, and you can see that there's going to be some urine coming down, lovely. So there's some urine coming nicely down that ureter on the right side. So when we look at that longitudinally, we want to try and get as good a view as possible. That's great. That's it there. Good. And so you want to have a ureter that's less than six millimeters in its AP diameter. It's also really important because we're now looking just at the distal third of that ureter. And what you want to do is you want to follow that ureter approximately as much as possible as it swings here is the ureter just here and the urine itself is coming down nicely and we're following that past up the into the middle third of the ureter just here so here's the ureter nice vermiculation there so there's definitely no signs of any distal or mid ureteric obstruction or compression of that ureter so no signs of any hydro ureter coming back to the mid sagittal view, bladder base in the midline swinging to the left side, to the contralateral side. And I think that the ureter is just sitting just here, very, very close to the tip of the probe. So this is our ureter on the right side. And again, we can measure that. To me, again, it's looking at a normal diameter, 1.3 millimeters, which is great. And then what we want to do is again, just wait to see some urine production and get a feel for, and again, we can see swinging around here, you can see that ureter, it almost has a little right-hand bend, there you go there, so absolutely beautiful demonstration by our young patient on cue, so thank you so much. <laughs> Your kidneys are working beautifully, all right? Which is good, so I'm very happy with that. So we're happy with the right ureter, we're happy with the left ureter, we can see that here's the urine coming from here, and as we follow that, you'll see that vermiculate, and then you'll see that dilated ureter then contract beautifully to squeeze that urine down towards the bladder. So I, I, there's no signs of any compression of that ureter either distally or in the mid-segment. Great, so we'll go back to our conventional view. So we've looked at 
the uterus and ovaries, we've assessed for ovarian mobility. We're going to need to look back to see the ovarian mobility in relation to the uterosacral ligaments. And so what we want to do now is we want to come into our posterior compartment. Uh, we know that based on the initial ultrasound scan that there's a rectal lesion here that's fixed to the posterior uterine fundus. And we can see straight away that as we bring that probe into play, just coming into here, one of the first things I look at posteriorly is I want to look at the vagina. So I maximize my view there. And that's the sonolucent area just here. As I swing to the left, looking specifically at vagina, so posterior vaginal fornix, this is the left posterior lateral vaginal fornix, back to the midline, swinging to the right, so the right, posterior lateral vaginal fornix. So I think that in this situation here that the vagina is normal. So I'm happy with that. So there's no obvious vaginal endometriosis, which is good. And then coming back into play again, that's the left ovary. So we're going to come back to the uterus, bringing the uterus as our landmark. And you can definitely see here that there's a hypoechoic lesion just here. And that is just coming into play I think in this region here, so I think this represents torus uterinus disease. So we're talking about the origin of the uterosacral ligaments and where they meet in the midline. This to me represents the torus uterinus and I think that we've got a degree of endometriosis, a deep endometriotic lesion within the torus uterinus. That's good, so Taurus, Uterinus, that's great. There's the Taurus and there's the space, so Uterinus, that's good. And then we can say that there's an endo there, that's great. And then come to that transverse. So this is the other aspect here of the Taurus disease just here. Okay, that's good. So again, coming to the midline. So I think there's the Taurus disease and that's almost contiguous with that rectal lesion. So the two I think are fixed. And so if we were to potentially trace those disease using our caliper, so I want to trace. Yeah, so we can see that. Yeah, so we can see that this is the, the Taurus disease coming around here. That's good. And set that. And then another little caliper. Another trace. And so and this here represents the anterior rectal lesion itself. That's great. That's good. So we can clear that. So again, now I want to see if there's any obvious uterosacral disease. So again, I've got the probe sitting in the posterior vaginal fornix, and as I swing to the right, this is the right ovary coming into view just here, and you get the impression that there is indeed some adherence between the right ovary and that uterosacral lesion. So the ovary is probably stuck inframedially to the uterosacral ligament as well as medially to the actual uh, uterus itself. That's our Taurus disease there as we swing to the right. And I think we've got some uterosacral disease just coming into play just here. So this is um, I think the right uterosacral ligament endometriosis. So we can archive that. And again, here we can see again there, I just get the impression that there's some sonolucency just in here within that right uterosacral ligament just there. Okay, that's good. And I think there's fixation on that side. And as we come back to the midline, so there's the uterosacral disease again, sorry, the torus uterus disease, the bowel will come back to that. And as we swing to the left, here's the hemorrhagic corpus luteum. And I think that the left uterosacral ligament, which is coming into view here, I think for me is looking pretty good. So we will look at the LUSL 
is okay. So that's great. So I'll clear that. That's great. So the left uterus ligament, I think, is looking good. Excellent. So we can clear that again. And then coming back to the midline again, we want to have a look specifically at the relationship between the rectum. One of the things morphologically, when I look at this rectal lesion, as I move that probe back and forth, you just get the impression that there may be maybe some spikes towards the lumen itself. So this is the posterior muscularis, is the contents of the bowel. And then this, I just get the impression there might be some slight spikes towards. Now, we don't know specifically if that represents submucosal invasion, um, but that it's something that we're looking at specifically in phase one of the idea, uh, idea study, where we're looking specifically at just the different morphological types to see if they can correlate with underlying histology and depth penetration. So that's an important aspect of the idea approach. Now, the other thing is, is as I gently just withdraw that probe, what I'm trying to do is get a feel for the vagina, which is here, the rectovaginal septum, which is here, the muscularis of the bowel here. So we're looking specifically here at the rectovaginal septum. And I, my feeling is that the uh, rectovaginal septum itself is intact. So we've got a normal rectovaginal septum. Very good, just in this vicinity here. So there's your rectovaginal septum there. Now remember, almost every time, the rectovaginal septum itself tends to be clear of disease. So that's very reassuring, such that when you perform the surgery and having mobilized the ureters laterally, and in this case, with the right ovary being fixed, we know from work that Shannon Reed's done with the negative sliding sign, particularly medially, we're more likely to perform a ureterolysis. So under those circumstances, we would perform a ureterolysis, we'd mobilize the lateral and pa uh, medial parietal spaces, get into the rectovaginal space, which we know is going to be clear based on the fact that the rectovaginal septum itself is preserved, and then having normalized the anatomy, then obviously assess this rectal lesion and make that decision as to what we're going to be doing. If we look at the size again of this rectal lesion and we try to get its maximal length in mid-transverse view, I think we can probably say, I'll measure that again. So that's going to come to there. So it's 26 millimeters in length, that lesion itself. If we look at the transverse view itself again, I think that um, this is the, I'm going to use the trace again. So we can see that this is the lumen of the bowel which I don't think is necessarily compromised. And then this is the actual transverse view here of the rectal lesion just coming into view here. So based on that, I think that the lumen itself in this individual case is not compromised by this uh, anterior rectal lesion. And so the other thing that we want to do also, coming back to where that rectal lesion is just coming into play, there it is just there, and we're nearly done. So you want to try it. The other thing is just to make sure from a color perspective. So we're going to use our ADF. And again, we just slightly change. That's good to there. And so these lesions themselves are almost certainly uh, without vascularity, which is also a reassuring thing as well. So the, I think one of the last things that we want to do, and then when we look at that view there, you can see get a really nice view there of the actual normal muscularis of the rectum anteriorly, the normal muscularis of the rectum posteriorly, and then this normal muscularis here becomes uh, expanded and sonolucent or hypoechoic with the presence of this anterior rectal nodule that's fixed to upper vagina, fixed to the torus uterinus, and also fixed to the actual uh, upper uh, posterior uterine fundus. So I think that the pouch of Douglas is obliterated in this circumstance. And then the last thing that we want to do is to ascertain the distance. And again, this is an estimation. So I'll come back to trace. And we want to determine the length from the most inferior aspect of this lesion to the anal verge. 
And so we will add those. So 18 millimeters. And then I just, and again, it's an estimation. And again, we want to have a fairly reasonable idea of where we finish with the last part of the probe. I'll clear that. That's good. I'm going to keep tracing. That's great. So 18 millimeters, keeping my hand still, plus 21 is, is 39. And we do the same again. Okay, clear that. And we'll go to the trace again. That's great, 39 plus 24 is 59, 63, 63, 63 plus 25 is 83 and 5 is 88 millimeters. And we're nearly there. So I'm doing this as the last part of the scan. So the first part of the scan is looking at the muscularis. The last part of the scan is looking at the muscularis. And I said 80, 89 plus 22 is 111. And 111 plus 23 is 134. It's difficult, isn't it? Very challenging with a live audience. 134. And this is probably the last bit. So we're coming just towards the annual version now, 134 plus 154. That's great. And then we're probably, we're out now. So we'll do the last part. So 154. And then we're plus another eight, 19 takes it to 173. So we're 17 centimeters from the annual verge. So we know that this is an upper rectal lesion. Uh, from the idea consensus perspective, it's above the level of the, uh, we're at the level of the torus, we've got an 18 centimeter clearance to the anal verge. So it's not going to be any a low uh, rectal procedure, whether we do a, a disc or a resection. And so there would be no need for a defunctioning ileostomy on that basis. Uh, and also we would, if we were going to do something definitive in the form of a segmental resection, based on the scan and the location of this lesion, the fact that it's a unifocal lesion, uh, we would, well, I think there'd be a very low risk of, uh, fistula and also rectal leak. Based on our first 140 cases that we've done together, myself and the colorectal team at the Pian, um, we've never defunctioned anybody and we've had one leak since 2012 in 140 cases. So very good results indeed. So that brings us to the end of our live scan today. Um, a big thank you to our patient. Uh, and obviously we're going to sit down after the scan today and talk about her subsequent management. A big thank you to Canon for sponsoring this session. Uh, so a big, big shout out to the team here in Sydney, Australia. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference as the scientific chair for ISWOG. Um, I know that it's going to be an incredibly dynamic conference with people from all around the world with more than 3000 delegates. So we look forward to seeing you in the virtual world. Thank you.